is going to be something a little bit different, um, and hopefully you'll enjoy it and maybe learn something. I'm going to be talking about uh, artificial intelligence and fetal cardiac imaging. And while I have no disclosures, please don't ask me about coding or... <laughs> I am a content expert, it's what they call us. I don't actually do uh, most of the heavy lifting with artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is a great, uh, it's, a, it's a great topic to talk about. We have all kinds of new things happening in, in fetal echo with earlier fetal echo and precision medicine and disparities research and gene therapy. But uh, I think by far the most press is being given right now to artificial intelligence. And so it's worth speaking about. But first, I want to give you some definitions and basic concepts and then show you how it may apply to fetal cardiac screening. Finally, uh, talk a little bit about challenges for the future. So what is artificial intelligence? Well, actually, this is a little controversial, but most people agree with some version of this Venn diagram where artificial intelligence is uh, sort of all of it, and machine learning, and then deep learning is a subset of machine learning. In 1959, Arthur Samuel, who was a computer scientist who pioneered the study of artificial intelligence, described machine learning as the study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And we're actually living with this uh, already every day with spam filters and speech recognition, Google searches, chat GPT, et cetera. Um, so I like to sort of simplify that to say that machine learning is a subset of AI where the machine is trained to learn from its past experience. This entire field has expanded in many ways that I won't be able to cover in uh, this short period of time. So I'll mostly be focusing on medical applications, but the important basic concepts are that rules-based algorithms apply rules to data while machine learning algorithms learn patterns from the data. So it's a, it's, it sounds like a subtle difference, but um, at any rate, there are several types of machine learning algorithms that are shown on this uh, slide. There's statistical machine learning, uh, deep learning from neural networks, which is the area I work in. Uh, and these neural networks are a type of machine learning algorithm that's especially useful for complex nonlinear data. Um, so we're going to change things up a little bit now, start looking at some pictures that are not necessarily cardiac, but really touch on a significant aspect that underlies a lot of what we do with congenital heart disease, and that is really the underpinnings in genetic etiology. Same disclosures as yesterday. So congenital heart disease, as we all know, has a very strong relationship with aneuploidy syndromes, single gene mutations, as well as, if you're speaking about array, copy number variants or variants of uncertain significance. The extent of that association differs significantly by lesion. So some of them, such as typical D transposition, are very weakly associated with any underlying genetic etiology. Others are very strongly. The genetic basis is likely to become a bigger component to things as we get better at our testing. So when we looked at simple things like karyotype, there was a substantial amount of CHD that did not look like it was associated with gross abnormalities on fetal karyotype. But as our resolution increases, so microarray, next generation sequencing, and as we're, now as we're into exome and potentially genome sequencing, these genetic associations are starting to become a lot clearer. Um, specifically related to exomes, and obviously genome, which will include an exome, we're starting to see these emerge significantly. The rasopathies, which would be abnormalities within the Noonan spectrum, which we'll get to shortly, ciliopathies, and various types of heterotaxy. So some lesions, as I said, are more syndromic than others. And two of them that have very strong associations with underlying genetic etiologies are anything within the tetralogy spectrum as well as AV septal defects. So tetralogy absolutely can be isolated, but can be seen with trisomy 21. This is um, 
I think a typical fetal echo board question when they ask you for the type of cardiac lesion that's most strongly associated with trisomy 21, everybody answers AVSD, but it's actually tetralogy AVSD, which has a stronger association. Trisomy 18, DeGeorge, allergial, multiple other syndromic associations. Similar to AV septal defect, absolutely can be isolated, but a good rule of thumb, if you see one on an ultrasound, your immediate risk of Down syndrome is about 50%. Trisomy 21, various other syndromes, et cetera. So as a good point of reference, and I'm gonna draw your attention to this article in 2018 by Pierpont, it's, it's really a good comprehensive article on the genetic underpinnings of CHD in general. But if we break it down based on what was known in 2018, genetic environmental overall probably only contribute about a third to slightly less than that of etiology. We're left with single... We're going to move on to the first lecture, which I'm going to give, which is a 2023 update on ultrasound evaluation of the carotid arteries. And I have two disclosures. Uh, one is that I'm an educational consultant for Philips Healthcare, and I am also briefly going to discuss the potential use of intravenous ultrasound contrast in the carotid arteries to evaluate plaque, which is not yet FDA approved for vascular imaging, though like cardiologists, you can certainly use this uh, off-label. And I want to start by talking about the pathophysiology of stroke. We're all uh, very familiar with uh, ischemic uh, pathology in the other peripheral arteries. And when somebody has an ischemic um, uh, condition in the uh, arms or the legs, this is usually due to a flow-reducing uh, lesion. But that's not the case for uh, ischemic injury in the head. And most strokes are caused by emboli. And while many emboli uh, originate uh, within the heart, about 20% of them are due to disease at the carotid bifurcation. So when we think about evaluating carotid pathology, remember that the primary bad actor, in fact, is the vulnerable plaque. And therefore, I think we ought to begin our exam by evaluating the plaque. On the other hand, we are going to grade an ICA stenosis, and uh, I think you need the stenosis as well as a vulnerable plaque to end up with a stroke, and lots and lots of data have shown that the uh, degree of the ICA stenosis is a very good surrogate marker for the risk of stroke. And while the charts that we all use to grade the ICA stenosis using Doppler criteria are extremely important, you do need to know when those charts do not work. And they do not work when a patient has very tortuous vessels or a contralateral stenosis or an occlusion, tandem long segment or near occlusive lesions, patients with high or low cardiac output states, and patients following intervention with either endarterectomy or stent placement. And we're going to show some examples of uh, these situations. And in order to keep yourself out of trouble by putting undue reliance on the chart, uh, my basic uh, recommendation is that you should always correlate your spectral Doppler findings with the grayscale and color Doppler plus the waveforms. And if there is a discordance between your spectral Doppler criteria and what you see with grayscale, color Doppler, and the waveforms, you need to explain that discordance. And by doing so, this is going to keep you out of trouble. In addition, you want to understand the waveforms, and they're very fascinating because these provide you clues to more proximal or distal cardiovascular disease that's beyond the scope of your ultrasound exam. And then finally, another reason you don't want to put too much reliance on the chart is that you do need to continuously reevaluate your chart based on outcome analysis and change in patient management.